I am now pleased to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Jack Shonkoff. Dr. Shonkoff is a pediatrician and leader in the field of early childhood development. Dr. Shonkoff is the Julius B. Richmond Family Professor of Child Health and Development at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health and Harvard Graduate School of Education, Professor of Pediatrics at Harvard Medical School and Boston Children's Hospital, Research Staff at Massachusetts General Hospital, and Director of the Center on the Developing Child at Harvard University. We are so honored and grateful that he's here with us today to share his work, and I will turn it over to him now. Dr. Shankoff? Thank you very much, Catherine. It's really a pleasure to be here with you today. So let me tell, whoops, to go back. Sorry about that. Um, so the title of my presentation is to connect what we know about early childhood development and lifelong health and think about it within a COVID-19 world. So I'm going to give you a crash course in 21st century science and how it can help us understand uh, the topic for today. So um, for starters, um, looking at COVID-19 through an early childhood lens, there are a couple of points that I want to put on the table. First, um, there's nothing new about the disparities associated with poverty, racism, and other structural inequities. We see that in just about everything we look at in the healthcare system. Um, but what is a really important opportunity for the public to understand is the striking variations in susceptibility to illness and response to treatment, um, and really underscore what is a, a pervasive issue all through um, the healthcare system and the healthcare world and physical and mental health, which is that um, there's huge variability. Uh, in this case, um, age, um, pre-existing medical conditions, uh, life circumstances have all gotten a reasonable amount of attention. Um, what the important lesson here in terms of the impact of COVID-19 on very young children is that they are clearly by age uh, relatively spared um, from serious illness, although it certainly exists in young children. So there might be this false sense that, gee, nothing bad is happening to young children. When in fact, the stresses uh, that their families are experiencing um, are probably having uh, enormous effects on many, many children that will have lifelong consequences. The next issue to, to kind of highlight here is that um, the health and well-being of young children is inextricably tied to the health and well-being of the adults who care for them. So just about any question that anyone will ask, which is, so how, what can we do to protect our young children from the consequences of this level of adversity? What, how can we minimize the risk for later problems? The correct answer, no matter where the, the issues are coming from, is always children's, very young children's health and well-being is tied into the ability of the adults who care for them to buffer them from adversity, to provide a well-regulated caregiving environment in which healthy development can unfold. The third issue here, which has actually gotten very little attention in all of the public press about the um, the, uh, the, the underlying risk conditions or serious consequences from COVID-19 is that the, pre, the most common pre-existing medical conditions that impose the highest risk, um, largely obesity, metabolic syndrome, uh, heart disease, diabetes, we've all heard about this over and over again, all of these adult medical conditions are associated with greater adversity early in life. Something to kind of really think about in terms of uh, young children today who are not physically ill, but whose families are experiencing enormous pressures, the kind of incubators for increased prevalence of many of these chronic diseases later in life. And I'm, in a minute or two, I'm gonna walk you through the underlying science that helps us understand how that happens. Uh, uh, so uh, 21st century science, particularly the biological sciences has been exploding uh, over the last few decades and is deepening our understanding about the origins of disparities, both in early learning, early behavior, as well as lifelong physical and mental health. And there are three take-home messages that I want to kind of share with you um, this afternoon. The first is the early childhood field has been heavily influenced for the last 20 years by the explosion of neuroscience with our understanding of how much early experiences shape brain architecture and how excessive uh, what we call toxic stress disrupts the circuitry of the developing brain well, the science is now very clear 
but the brain is connected to the rest of the body. So the impact of early adversity, not only well documented in terms of its effects on brain development, but also now increasingly we're learning more about its effects on the immune system, the effects on metabolic regulatory systems, which is opening up that black box of why is it that children who experience excessive amounts of adversity early in life, on average, are more likely not only to have problems um, with early learning and readiness to succeed in school, which is where the early childhood policy field has been focusing, but also these are the building blocks of the most common chronic diseases that we see decades later in life. The second uh, concept, take home message, is the importance of understanding the critical influence of variation in sensitivity to the environment. This is an issue related to risk stratification. It is certainly true on average that young children who are experiencing significant adversity will be more likely to incur health problems later in life. But, but the underlying biology is crystal clear that the name of the game is variation in sensitivity to the environment. It's the interaction between not only environmental exposures, but genetic differences on an individual basis. There are children from birth who are genetically more sensitive to the environment around them, more sensitive to experiences. And in tough environments, they are much more likely to have problems. And in, 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 in well-resourced growth-promoting environments, they're actually more likely than average to thrive. These are children who are extremely sensitive to differences in the environment, which also includes programs and treatments. So there will be differential response to treatments and interventions. We have to recognize this is the underlying scientific explanation is there is no one size fits all, both for exposures or for treatments. And in fact, uh, the way we will improve our impacts at scale at a population level is to ask the question not whether interventions work or not, but for whom do they work, for whom do they not? Uh, I think this audience understands this quite well because you understand the revolution that's driving a uh, precision medicine approach to treatment of disease in adults now. It's not a matter of just picking the one exposure or the one best intervention. The third issue uh, that science is telling us about how we ought to think about early childhood is the, uh, the importance of critical and sensitive periods in development. Uh, critical periods and decreasing plasticity related to brain development have been known for decades. But what science, really the frontiers of science are telling us right now is that there are, in a parallel way, critical periods in the development of the immune system, development of metabolic regulatory systems that are influenced by prenatal exposures, whether they be excessive stress activation, whether they be exposure to environmental pollutants, whether they be issues related to nutrition. And in the first, or second, the first 12 to 24 months of life, there are a number of programming effects on the immune system and metabolic systems that are much more difficult to change later. Uh, so let me move to the next slide and bring you inside with a little bit of a crash course on the biology of adversity and resilience, which explains how excessive stress can undermine the foundations of healthy development. What is it about adverse experiences? What is it about stress that gets into the body? How does it lead to problems of disease? How does it affect early learning? Well, starting at 10,000 feet and working down, everything, all learning behavior and health is influenced by the interaction among genetic variation on an individual basis, environmental stressors, and developmental time. And if we then kind of look inside the body and ask the question of what do we know about the stress response system, we know that it is made up of multiple components. So when we are stressed, when we are threatened, uh, there is an elevation of stress hormones to the hypothalamic pituitary axis. There is an increase in heart rate and blood pressure. Um, the inflammatory system is activated. Metabolic regulation is affected, oxidative stress, um, insulin resistance, problems related to disruptions of metabolism on a chronic basis, epigenetic effects on gene expression, developmental pacing, chronic stress activation actually accelerates the aging process, and of course, uh, the well-known effects on brain circuitry and electrical activity. The important message here is that our stress response system with all these components that are highly interrelated is our friend. Um, these, these physiological responses that I've just 
the striker of what we all feel when we are stressed. Everyone knows what that feels like when you are optimally stressed. It helps us deal with threat in an acute situation. It's intended to then go back to normal, to baseline. When it doesn't go back to baseline and it is chronically activated, what basically helps us in an acute situation then has a wear and tear effect on multiple organ systems, the brain, cardiometabolic systems, inflammatory system, immune systems, and all of these, if I had more time, I could go into more examples, help us make the link between early adversity and chronic stress activation and why we see the kinds of health problems that appear later in life. <clears throat> so let me just end this presentation by trying to make the link between why investments in early childhood are not only important for early learning and readiness to succeed in school, um, which is more on the kind of the protection side and on the enrichment side, providing enriched experiences to promote early literacy. But what the science is telling us is that early investments that protect biological systems from toxic stress, investments that help to strengthen the ability of adults to buffer children from the adversity around them, to help scaffold and uh, help the development of the building blocks of resilience in children very young. Resilience is built over time. It's not wired in automatically at birth. Investments early on that will protect these systems will generate a substantially larger return on investment than just when we look at the return on educational achievement and economic productivity. You can see from this chart that three of the five most costly adult diseases that you are all very familiar with are associated with early life adversity. They are much more prevalent among adults who early in infancy had excessive activation of their stress response systems. So the message here is, the take home message is that science informed investments that reduce hardships and adverse exposures faced by pregnant women and families raising young children offer a promising pathway to enormous savings in healthcare costs decades later as a result of helping to protect these developing systems from excessive stress activation. Um, for those of you who want more information, um, here's the website for our center, developingchild.harvard.edu. We have a, a extensive materials Translating Science for Non-Scientists. And uh, this, our latest working paper, paper number 15, uh, which just came out in June, was titled Connecting the Brain to the Rest of the Body, Early Childhood Development and Lifelong Health are Deeply Intertwined. So uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to be part of this webinar. I look forward to the next presentations and the discussion.